I, um, I had to laugh uh, when I found the, that the sermon for today and the theme of today was based on Christian unity. Ha ha God. God always has a sense of humor. So today we are celebrating Christian unity around the world in all kinds of Christians and also throughout the centuries. And we're actually celebrating the 500th year of the Reformation this year. So those of us, which includes us, who are not Catholic and not Orthodox, basically, um, have our faith that was founded by Martin Luther King 500 years ago. One million. Mesh <laughs> <laughs> those two there. And, um, and this is especially poignant to talk about this today um, after such a fractious election and the inauguration of our president with Trump Christians Trump on both Trump sides, Trump right? Trump Christians Trump on both Trump sides, Trump people who are on one side Trump of Trump 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 um, voting and people who are on another. And as well, this is a personal struggle for me, um, reconciling the beliefs that I have and who I believe Jesus is calling us to be with those who also claim Jesus, who I find to be working for very different things. So will you pray with me as we move into this time of reflection together? God of Rebecca and of Jacob, God of Chloe and of Constantine, God of Billy Graham and Harriet Tubman, be with us in this time together of reflection She's not and fine. may the meditations that are offered today and the musings wow. of our heart draw us closer to you. Why don't we um, the so um, sometimes I still can't believe that I have thrown in my lot with Christianity. You know, when I look at our history, we have had hundreds of years of participating in dividing people, in dominating people, and enslaving people. And most recently, we share our faith with people who believe that climate change is a hoax and are okay with warming up the planet for my family. Who believe that we should ban Syrian refugees from finding sanctuary in our borders and to normalize the invasion of another person's body. I'm gonna keep it all. And I have really struggled with this. What does Christian oh, unity mean yeah, in will. the face of a trans team who it on is the shaky face. in their transition and looking for acceptance? No. Yeah, you need to prep and hold it what does it mean to invite them to the same the Christian table that God and Jesus calls us to sit at with a bishop who believes that He's an, adult, he's an abomination, and that God does not have, that he's not a part of God's plan. These two seem irreconcilable. And as I ponder ministry and I ponder how to serve all of Christian faith, I really struggle with this. And sometimes I want to tell Paul, sure, that sounds great. Let's have a church where some of us belong to Cephas, and let's have a church where some belong to Paul. Let's have a church where some belong to Paul. But I, what I keep coming back to is Jesus talked about this, and he said that they may all be one. So I know that this is an important call. And Paul, um, the letters from Paul to the early congregants are some of the first words that we have of Jesus' ministry. And it's to people who are trying to live in faith responding to Jesus' call. So Paul is telling them, this is important. You cannot just go your own way and not claim each other. You cannot find your own path and just travel. We all belong to Jesus. So when I think about this, I'm really grateful to the rich history, our rich Christian history, because while we do have to claim the hard parts of our history, we also get to claim some beautiful prophets. And the two I want to talk about today are Martin Luther King, the real Martin Luther King, not Martin Luther. <laughs> He's also important. And also James Cone, who's a black liberation theologist. So Martin Luther King, we like to talk a lot about his beautiful quotes about love and building bridges. And sometimes I think we water down his prophetic call to us. And 
and um, it comes shining through in the letter um, that he wrote after he had been jailed for protesting. And he's writing to white ministers who are telling him, slow down, take it easy. You know, it's gonna, freedom's gonna come, it just takes time, and we'll get to it. And he's saying, no, no, you do not get to be martyred on this. This is an issue of justice. But what strikes me in this letter, and I made some copies, so if you haven't ever read it, I really encourage you to read it. it the font is tiny, but you can also find it online. In this letter, he's calling people to account, but he does it with such profound love. And we hear it in the excerpt today. He does it just in profound love. So love, right? Calling people to justice, but with love. <coughs> And when we look at uh, black Christians in this country, you know, they've had to reconcile with this far longer than I have. They've had to uh, join faith with people who enslaved them and who enforced Jim Crow laws, and yet they continue to choose that same faith. So I find their thought, thinking very helpful on this. They're much more involved than my uh, elementary steps. And one of the things that James Cone, who's sort of the founder of black liberation theology, he says that it is, if it is not liberating, then it is not the gospel. So Jesus comes to liberate. We see that theme throughout his whole ministry over and over again. He liberates people from sickness. He liberates people from uh, being less than human. He liberates people from enslavement. He liberates people from uh, gender-based discrimination. And so Cone really helps me in this. If it's not liberating, then it is not the gospel. It is not the good news. So I, I like to use these two lenses when I struggle with this issue. Is it with love, and is it liberating? So our gospel today from Matthew begins as Jesus, as I said, is beginning his ministry. He's just come down from the wilderness, and um, he travels from Nazareth to Galilee. And in our scripture today, the translation we have said, uh, turn four, turn away. Um, it's an inclusive New Testament, but many of the translations say repent. And he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I don't know about you guys, but when I first read that, I just saw a sign in a signboard, a guy in a signboard with a big megaphone on the street corner, and it's like somebody I want to walk away from, not somebody I really want to listen to. But let's listen to this, because often Jesus turns phrases, right? So, repent in Greek means change your mind. Change your mind. And in Hebrew, we go to an early translation, it's turn to, or turn, or. And it's not a oh, word that's used for show remorse. You know, it's not like, oh, I repent that we think that was okay. But it's choose a new direction. Choose a new direction. Turn toward a new direction. And this word of kingdom is really a struggle sometimes, too, because we think of kingdoms as having a monarch. But we need to remember that in Jesus' time, he was saying the ruler, the Roman ruler, is not your king nor are the priests in the temple who control everything. God is, and Jesus are, kings, right? And with Jesus' message, it's a new message of mutuality and of humanity. He liberates people from their oppression. And so when he's talking about this kingdom, or kingdom, as some people like to talk, call it, he's inviting people into this new way of being together. This new way that does away with these artificial barriers that separate us and divide us. And it, he's not talking about some far off place in heaven or once this world explodes and we all get brought up. He's actually talking about it being somewhere on earth here. So the kingdom is happening here. So I hear love and liberation in both of those. Repent, turn away from, turn toward, make a new plan into this beautiful time of mutuality, shared humanity. And next, Jesus calls fishermen. And he doesn't call woodworkers, he doesn't call bakers, he doesn't call rock quarriers. And that is because, I had no idea about this, but in um, pagan and Jewish understandings at the time, fishing 
was understood to be a spiritual metaphor for calling people to life. Calling people to life. I would love it if we call people to life on Sunday. We'd be doing our job. So Jesus' first act of ministry is he calls us to return, to find a new way. And he's inviting us to bring a new time on earth of mutuality and liberation. And he's inviting helpers. He's asking helpers to call other people to life. So we who believe in the good news, and we who want to say yes to Jesus' call and his invitation to follow him, we're saying yes to repenting, to turning away. We're saying yes to this new kingdom. And we're saying yes to calling all people to life. That means people who vote both ways. That means people who marched yesterday. And that means people who sell, held up signs against the marchers. That means people who attended the inauguration with sh pride shining in their eyes. And that means people who protested the inauguration. It means we work for the liberation for those who are in chains. And we work to love those who enslave them. I myself want to think about this uh, personally, and when I ask myself, what do I need to repent from? What do I need to turn to? What do I need, need to make a change? My confession is I really have a hard time with this. I, um, I, when I am thinking about Christians who hurt <coughs> other people who are precious to me, based on their theology. I want to dismiss them. I want to turn them into caricatures. And I turn off my heart in anger because I know the pain that they have caused other people who are precious to me and I know are precious to Jesus. But that is not liberating. And that is not love. That is righteousness. And it's not Jesus' message. Jesus invites us to be a part of liberating love for all, the marginalized and those who privilege from the center, the oppressed and the oppressor. And this is hard work, doggone it. And Jesus knew that. That's why he surrounded himself with people. So I ask you, who are your helpers? Who are your helpers on this hard road who can remind you of the humanity of those who are different than you? And encourage you when you are weary, when you are working for the liberation of all, when you are bringing God's kingdom to this earth. Jesus appears suddenly and disruptively to these fishermen. There's no discussion. He doesn't try to persuade them. He doesn't use fancy words. He goes right to the heart of faithful discipleship. Follow me. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come, Jesus says. Follow me.